Oh, thank you very much, Melissa. And, and yeah, as you say, it's a lovely rainy day as well. We're talking about drought, so um, puts it in perspective when you've got rain. <laughs> nice little bit of rain. Can I just check you can see my slide? Um, yes, everybody... you can see it. Yeah, right. Yeah, just checking because I can't see what everybody's looking at, just what I'm looking at. Uh, yeah, as Melissa said, I'm going to first of all set the scene before um, I talk about the environment and some of the land impacts. But I want to set the scene of drought and drought management in Wales before we start. Um, I mean, a lot of people ask, well, what is a drought? Well, there is no single definition of drought but they're all characterised by a degree of rainfall shortage. It's a natural event, we can't prevent it, but each drought is different in its nature, its timings and its impacts, and therefore we can go some way to potentially mitigate some of those impacts or make us resilient to drought. And it affects public water supply, agriculture, environment, industry, people and society, as well as navigation and other water users. And um, typically, ourselves, natural swells and other regulators identify three main types of drought which may occur, an environmental drought, an agricultural drought or water supply drought. But as I say, drought means different things to different people. Just for um, it's worth mentioning the stages of drought that we declare in Wales as NRW. We, our drought plan defines these. Normal, prolonged dry weather, drought, and then recovery from drought. And some of you may have seen the media using some of those terms. And we trig uh, the triggers for defining the stages can be based on hydrological thresholds, soil moisture deficits, but also what's happening in terms of impacts to environment, water supply, agriculture, and forestry based decisions about where, when we declare each of these st stages. But it's worth noting, and Tom may touch on this, that water companies have their own drought plans and therefore their stage of drought might be slightly different. Some of the history of droughts, well, in, previously we've had quite significant droughts, particularly in 1976, 1989, 1995. But the last time we actually declared drought in Wales was 2005, 2006. But we did experience prolonged dry weather, that first stage of drought in the summer of 2018 and 2020. But really, 2022 was the first time we had drought declared across the whole of Wales. That's not to say that in the previous years we haven't seen impacts, though, to agriculture or private water supplies. But as a whole scale drought, 2022 was quite a, a notable year. Um, but why was it notable? Well, I'll go into that in a minute, but I just want to remind people of who manages drought in Wales. The main organisations, ourselves, Natural Swells, and we sort of reg we regulate, but we also uh, respond to the drought ourselves. And the Welsh government set the planning and, and the policy and legislative framework, and then the water companies themselves with their water company plans, public water supply. But there's other organisations off what Public Health Wales. Canal and Rivers Trust, Local Resilience Forums, Consumer Accounts for Water and the farming unions are all involved in drought management. And as a result, the Welsh Drought Liaison Group is convened, which is chaired by the Welsh Government, containing some of the representatives of those organisations to form the Welsh Drought Liaison Group, of which we've got the three of three of our organisations here today to speak to you. Yeah, and then NRW's role in a drought is we monitor, report and act to reduce the impacts to the environment as well as to others. And we have specific actions to manage drought as defined in our drought plan. But we also manage Welsh government estates. Through that, we have visitor centres, natural nature reserves and forestry that we, which have vulnerable species. And we monitor the actions of the water companies delivering their drought plans and have regular meetings and as well as if we have drought permits we, we determine those and provide advice on drought orders as well as communicating with others as well and work cross-border of course with the environment agency and represent cross-border interests on their national drought group for England 
you might think, well, why why was there a drought? Well, the rainfall in August, as shown in the first map, was particularly notable in that this was a really dry August, but also the eighth month accumulated rainfall from um, March to October was 72% of the long term average, was actually the joint second driest equivalent eight month period. You know, 1995 was only drier and 1990 was equal. It's since 1865. So it was a very, very dry uh, period there. In addition, temperatures were record breaking, particularly mid in mid July. And you can see from this graph, if you're looking at the summer precipitation and the temperature, you can see that 2022 is really standing out as a very dry and hot year. So you can see like it was even, when you look at it in this context, drier and hotter than 1995 and 1976, some of those other key drought years that I mentioned, and 2018 and 2020. Uh, paling in significance when you start looking at 2022. And then some of the river flow stats for these are a, a, a graph showing all of our indicator sites in Wales. And you can see that the majority of them spent a lot of time notably low, below average or exceptionally low throughout April to September. So you can see why we had concerns. And then some of you may be interested uh, we've put the slide together of the sequence of events that occurred in Wales. We first went into prolonged dry weather in July in, in parts of Wales with the whole of Wales entering prolonged dry weather by the 22nd of July. And then by 18th of August, Southwest had been declared in drought, followed by the South East and Upper Severn. We will be work we worked with um, our cross border counterparts in the Environment Agency when declaring the status on the Upper Severn, and then the rest of Wales going to drought early September. But fortunately, uh, by end end of September, mid October, we started receiving rainfall, and September, October, November, we had a lot of rainfall. So as a result, by the end of October, we were going into recovery of drought. And by mid-November, we were in recovery of drought across the whole of Wales. And we were still had concerns for groundwater at that time. And therefore, uh, we returned to normal in January as a result of uh, the groundwater. And I'm pleased to say we're still currently at normal status. Um, now, some of the impacts that were had, um, some of the concerns we had during the Plong River drought uh, led to a number of incidents, but also observations on the ground with rivers drying up, which in itself meant that there was concerns for some abstractors and there was license restrictions in place and other users such as navigation or recreation had concerns, but we had incidents reported around water quality concerns, dissolved oxygen, fish in distress or killed, uh, as well as um, some uh, potential uh, concerns for low flows and illegal, potential legal abstractions that are being investigated. Some uh, notable examples of this is the River Cluin and the Cluid catchment dried up and we also had uh, rivers, the River D tributaries drying up. And that happens sometimes in previous dry years, but not to the extent it did in 2022, where we had to have uh, weeks and months of the flows being low or dry. One example you may have seen of fish in distress was on the River Ueni, where um, low flows were exasperated by a sinkhole where the water left underground and a significant stretch of the river Ueni uh, was affected. And the river temperatures at the time was meaning there were concerns for fish, for mono, for stone loach, forehead and trout. Um, on this circumstance, we did carry out a fish rescue uh, and other circumstances we don't necessarily depending. 
because it adds stress to the fish but you may have seen that in the news and some early indicator evidence being gathered by the fishery colleagues to tagging of salmon smolt on the usk passing there uh, below Newport into the estuary has indicated that in 2021, which was a wet year, 67% were tagged migrating past this point. But in the 2022 dry year, there was only 24%. So that's a 43% reduction. So you can see you know, the consequence of what the dry year was having on fisheries. It wasn't all um, uh, negative effects. We did see some positive effects. Um, my bryophyte colleague, and I don't admit to be an expert to be able to pronounce the Latin name, has said that some of the rare species of bryophytes, the, the mosses and liverworts that specialise in periodic drying of lake beds, appeared in abundance in uh, 2022. So uh, we saw some, some benefits to some species, but um, our colleagues on, are still determining some of the impacts to ecology in general because obviously they have to get results of their surveys that they would have been doing in autumn and this spring to see what the lasting effects were. Um, of course, I was just focusing on rivers there, but we've also got land impacts. Um, and the, uh, my colleagues have uh, given me some, some examples here where we, they were seeing dried seepages on our nature reserves, on our SSIs and the dune pool at Nubra in August 2022, but also grassland effects. I know the, the picture is showing 2018, but my colleague says there was a similar picture in 2022 where you can see the grassland effect over a period of time throughout, throughout um, droughts. And it's worth noting that we also had a few wildfires on our estate, uh, which which we we'll, had to respond to, but predominantly happened those during the heat wave early on in July and August. So the rain, when the rain came in the autumn, that helped appease some of the concerns. Um, some observations are mature forests generally coped well with the dry hotter conditions. However, there was concerns for the tree planting of the saplings. So as a result, we didn't, uh, we waited until September to plant them. So they remained in the nurseries for longer. That's something to consider for future is the impact it may be having to plant in trees when you're having a drought. So you know, you have to consider time scheduling in the future. And then um, just uh, in terms of some of the notable impacts that droughts have on invert features, uh, on ver invertebrate features on SSI, the, we have found that 16% of the 232 terrestrial and freshwater inverts that are triple SI qualifying features have high sensitivity to droughts and they are linked to the predominantly to the to seepage. Helps if I uh, lost my notes there. Uh, to seepage into the temporary uh, pools and the flooded fens. And this is a particular concern to species such as Club General, the Gwold Snail, the Southern Damselfly, and the Large Mason Bee. And during 2022, the fens of Anglesey and the Clean Peninsula were very dry in July and August. And therefore, the elements of invertebrates and fauna were scarce or even absent, such as crane flies, snail killing flies, and some soldier flies. I'm avoiding saying the Latin names, but if anybody wants to know them, I can send them afterwards. I don't want to embarrass my pronunciations. Um, and we also saw um, the wetlands on the Wern or at triple SI site on Anglesey also completely dried up with, where there's import where there's important species the club general uh, where larvae like to sit, sit in the aquatic carrier seepage and affects the grown world snail 
Yes, so there were some sort of notable observations of the impacts that the drought of 22 happened on the invert features, which if with climate change, potentially, obviously, there's species sensitive there. And we are all also still gathering evidence of surveys that we took on um, our mammals and potentially um, there were some impacts to some of the water voles because of dried up uh, burrows and therefore we're you know, having a look to see whether there's a forthcoming management plans to mitigate future drought events where we saw some notable impacts on water wells. And then just to conclude, I just want to give an overview of some of the actions that we took during the drought. And you may have seen some of these news article headlines that I've got in the slide pack here. Um, we were current, we were monitoring closely the situation. We were responding to the incidents, in, including in some circumstances, the fish, fish rescue that took place on the UNE. We were assisting the fire service to help with the wild uh, fires and deploy, deploying helicopters and other activities to manage fire on our land. We we're also asking people to abide by the countryside code and not like barbecues. We were issuing advice to anglers during the low flow, high temperature period as well as uh, requesting uh, Welsh water to make some fresh air releases late in, uh, in July and early August to aid flows and also cool the water temperatures down. Um, we, as I say, delight, we delayed our tree planting until later in the season where we're, um, the regulation schemes were operating and then we we're obviously imposing a um, abstractor restrictions for and then checking on the larger abstractors to check that they were complying. And we're also discussing potential voluntary restrictions for some of the larger abstractions for those that were previously exempt and then talking with the water companies and liaison cross border, as well as attending the Wales Drought Liaison Group and responding to other requests. And the next steps for us now is we are reviewing our post route lessons and then identifying recommendations and actions for improvements. Um, these will these are yet to be finalized internally, but when they are, there will be a series of actions we make make improvements to our drought plan, but also some will influence drought planning uh, policy and, and guidance for the future and will involve me talking with the Wales Drought Liaison Group membership as some were in partnership with the other sectors. So thank you for listening. I will stop sharing so that I can hand over to Gareth sharing. Thank you very much, Tracy. I couldn't see anyone. Sorry, Mr. You're on mute still. Um, I can hear you, Melissa. Yeah. OK, uh, so thank you, Tracy. Uh, our next speaker oh, is Gareth. I can hear you. Mm. I might I might have to take over because I can't hear. Um, you, Melissa, at the minute, but I was just good. we were just going to introduce you, Gareth, Barry, from the Farming Union for Wales to talk about the agricultural sector and some of the experience and impacts from the agricultural community's point of view. And you, uh, yeah, so thanks. Can uh, you thanks. share your screen? Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, we'll, we'll do now. Um, give me a second. Uh, there we are. Hopefully, everybody can see can see my slides now. Um, yeah, th thanks for the uh, brief introduction, uh, uh, Tracy. Um, as 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 you've just alluded to, um, my name is Gareth Parry, Senior Policy and Communications Officer for the Farmers Union of Wales. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview, really, of the impacts that 
the drought had on agriculture in Wales uh, throughout last year, and and as you'll you'll see in a moment, some of the impacts uh, you know are still still with us to this day in some way or other. Really, um, so. Just to kick off, um, I thought I'd go through go through a couple of um, initial impacts or reports really that we had from our FEW members um, last year when when we were sort of going into the official drought status. Um, so, um, sort of in reference to to Tracy's timeline there, really, which was sort of the the beginning of August when we were in official drought status. Um, and these are just a few of the reports really that we had. Um, so starting from the north of the country, um, we were having reports that silage crops in the summer were down by a third. Um, many were already feeding their full, full winter rations to their livestock, um, which obviously um, meant that, uh, you know, they, they obviously most of them will still be feeding winter rations uh, maybe up to this date. Um, but, uh, you know, it's only sort of now that they'll be starting to feel in the effects of any fodder shortages um, due to the early feeding of those rations last year. Um, and then at the sort of first breeding, uh, breeding ewe sales uh, in the summer last year ahead of the uh, breeding season last year, um, immediately we saw a £15 per head um, decrease in those prices simply because farmers were trying to offload um, stock um, due to the fact that they didn't have enough Order to feed them, um, and and they knew that um, that was one of the, the the ways that they could sort of mitigate the impacts that they would have um, over the winter that's just gone. Um, if we move down to Pembrokeshire, um, you know, uh, probably worse off still. Um, we we saw springs boreholes drying up, um, land was being burned. So not only was grass not growing, it was it was all it was burning what burning off what was already there. Um, again, many supplementary feeding as well as as we saw in North Wales, and and that obviously had a, a, a further impact on loss of condition in lambs, uh, and you know earlier harvesting of crops and silage etc. So uh, again, quite a common theme really across across the whole of the country. <clears throat> um, I'd say in particular some reports from Brecon, we had uh, sort of germination failures for some sort of certain crop species. Uh, and this resulted in some farmers having to seek derogations from their environmental schemes, such as Glastir. Um, so uh, I'll come back back to that in, in a moment. Um, South Wales again, uh, a similar sort of um, similar sort of picture, um, but you know many there really struggling to take even a second cut of silage. So you know by the time you get to August, um, you know many were struggling to even. Uh, harvest what they had, uh, not uh, you know, on top of the fact that they were feeding uh, rations from maybe their first cuts of silage, so um, a bit of a double negative situation there. Um, I would say uh, some uh, particular impacts on certain farms really as well. Some in uh, areas of special scientific um, uh, sites of um, special scientific interests, uh, triple SIs. Um, in some of those areas, the actual water sources for, for cattle were drying up, such as streams, etc. Um, and they were also having to deal with increased um, um, farm fires or, yeah, you know, um, land fires um, in the south of Wales, which went to an amber alert um, during this time as well, which Tracy has already alluded to. Um, and when we consider all these sort of impacts in particular when it comes to fodder um many feeding winter rations at a very early stage um there was some reports from ireland uh, facing similar similar issues um and some research research over there found that silage last year was was much less digestible um, because clamps were being opened up early and obviously as a result of that we had a more of a um more of a risk in terms of um mycotoxins etc in the silage um so so, so it, you know, it did it did reach that stage where where we, we were potentially seeing animal health and welfare um, issues as well uh, because of the drought. Um, if we look then beyond August, look at the longer term impacts that we've seen because of the drought. Um, we saw a temporary use ban for um, domestic water users, I would say, in Pembrokeshire, um, and while that did exclude those that needed to use water for business use. So obviously that included the, the provision of, of water to livestock. Um, 
it um you know a, a number of farmers um did have to revert from their private supplies uh, to mains mains water which um although as i mentioned the, the temporary use ban didn't affect them it obviously did have a huge effect on their cash flows where they'd gone from a position where their water water bills were zero or, or near, near zero uh, because of their private supplies um, and then having to pay uh, main supplies particularly for intensive um water intensive systems you know mainly dairy i would say or, or those using irrigation systems for for crops um and obviously as you know we were having regular meetings of the trout liaison group and there were regular questions being raised as to exactly what, what support was made available for farmers during this during this period um however the i would say the real impact of the drought on farmers was actually being hidden by the fact that farmers were selling stock um, or buying more fodder um, etc to avoid um to avoid reaching a position where we saw those animal health and welfare issues that, that i that i referenced so so it was it was a difficult situation in terms of being able to um evidence really the impact this was having on agriculture because farmers were proactively um you know yeah selling stock early or, or reducing their livestock um hold uh, or holding on the farm or buying more fodder etc you know so so it was a situation where the cash flow is having the impact rather that rather than the livestock themselves in in a sense um and you know we should also consider this and the fact that you know input costs last year went extraordinarily high um particularly when we consider fertilizer etc uh, so farmers were already applying less fertilizer on the land to produce fodder so so on top of the drought was it was a particularly particularly difficult difficult year for our farmers and our members last year um and uh, yeah as i already mentioned this obviously had a, had an impact on um on our cull u prices as well because because of the fact that so many farmers are trying to uh, trying to offload stock um uh, where where they could and i would say when we consider the longer term impacts of the drought this this and, and the next slide gives a good overview really um so this is a graph from habiki kumri um which shows the prime lamb live weight prices auction markets in Wales up to the 18th of February this year um and so on the 18th of February the uh, average sort of 228 pence per kilo uh, which was seven pence down on the previous week uh, but it was 33 pence down on the week uh, the same week last year uh, and 4.6 pence below the five-year uh, average so obviously this has got this is due to a number of reasons um cost of living crisis uh, less people um spending more money on premium cuts etc rising uh, production costs um increased imports from new zealand etc but but nevertheless um the drought had had its part to play in in affecting how how our livestock markets and, and livestock supply uh changed following uh last year um so for instance in january this year our um total uk lamb throughput was three percent higher than the year previous uh, but average carcass weights were slightly below what we saw last year. So again, you know, this this meant that our lambs were coming through later uh, at a, a less of a weight. So you know that, that emphasizes really the impact the drought has had in terms of when that fodder fodder was was available, and the fact that the fodder was available later in the season last year has had knock on effect on 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 our lamb prices going into this year um and and how how the picture looks you know ahead of ahead of the easter markets uh, effectively um and um, you know we we can almost uh say the same really for, for our milk prices in wales um well this this is a graph of of milk deliveries in great britain uh from hdb and we can see that there's a clear dip in production when we compare the 2021 22 and 2022-23 uh, figures from July to September, where, where you can see on the light blue line there on, on the graph. And um, just to provide some sort of con uh, context to this, really, um, we saw a huge increase in, in production costs last year, uh, which meant that there was a huge 52% increase in the prices paid for GB milk between November 2021 and 2022. Um, but due to the drought, it meant that farmers were, were struggled to maintain um, their production levels uh, last year. And, and while uh, yields did recover um, to 2.5% above uh, the year previous levels in September and November last year, uh, because we saw the late season of 
perfect grass growing conditions. We hadn't seen that usual dip uh, in milk production throughout the winter that we would typically see uh, in, in a normal year. Uh, so looking ahead, um, this could be problematic because we'll we'll soon see a spring flush of milk production um, because of because of um, grass growth, etc. Uh, fodder availability and uh, and the, um, depending on the calving system, of course. Um, so uh, already in March, we've seen price uh, milk prices being cut by ten pence per liter, and there's predictions of them falling by up to thirty pence per liter as well as we move into the spring. Um, you know, mainly because we haven't seen that that dip in the winter, but on top of that, we're seeing we'll see the spring flush of of milk as well uh, in due course. So, it, it, hopefully, you know that this just emphasizes the the impact a, a, a season of drought last year can have uh, can have on agriculture when we consider you know, how how um, how long term uh, agriculture processes can take and, and, and etc. Um. So, um, yeah, Tracy touched on the work that uh, NRW have done uh, throughout the drought period, and, and I just wanted to highlight briefly the, the support that was provided throughout this throughout this time to our farmers. Um, so Welsh Government pr produced some some guidance in terms of animal health and welfare uh, in, in periods of extreme weather. Uh, Farming Connect did some knowledge transfer um, sessions on water use. Um, there were regular dry weather updates from NRW. Uh, farmers received their BPS advance payments, which um, will happens ha happens every year now, where they receive seventy percent of their uh, advance payment in in October. Uh, but nevertheless, it was more so welcomed last year because of uh, because of the impacts that we'd seen. Um, and and we also had the regular drought liaison and group meetings with with stakeholders, and and uh, it was a welcomed opportunity for for the farming unions to be part of that group, really to to understand exactly what was going on. Uh, and and to share any support available really to our farmers, um, so so they could try and um, mitigate the impacts of this drought as much as possible, really, and notwithstanding the fact you know there are a number of things uh, as I've already alluded to, really that that are out of our control when it comes to uh, market supply and demand and 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 the weather patterns. Mm -hmm. um, so look, just looking ahead to the future. Um, you know, we believe that it's essential that we are pro proactive when it comes to uh, responding to prolonged periods of dry weather, uh, rather than be being reactive. And uh, hopefully, you can see the the quote on the right hand side there, which is from one of our uh, statements that we wrote last year in response to the drought, which it just emphasizes emphasizes that while the no two years are the same when it comes to weather, it's it's important that we can try and come up with effective solutions. Uh, that can be established and implemented in future years when when we see um, a build up really of, of dry weather um, according to figures from from people like uh, NRW and again Tracy's alluded to how uh, you know we, we we need to evaluate the um, suggestions and actions that we that we had last year and try and uh, be more proactive when when it comes to future uh, future dry weather events. Um, and you know this can involve regular meetings of the drought liaison group, um, and and maybe trying to start those meetings um, even even in the spring, effectively to just try and get a, a picture or an overview of where we are uh, since the first of January um, in terms of, of rainfall. Um, you know, uh, grants should also be available to help farmers collect and store rainwater uh, in preparation for these events. Uh, this is something that we raised last year. Uh, this could potentially be part of the optional layer of the sustainable farming scheme, um, rather than part of the universal layer that's that's currently uh, being proposed. Um, we also received some reports last year of some farmers going through the planning process, and as part of that process, they had to carry out water uh, percolation tests as part of uh, for the for the local authority. Uh, and again, you know, things like that needs need to be thought of when when doing those sort of processes in in periods of drought uh, so again i think a common sense approach would work here um when when using you know potentially thousands of gallons of water to do these sort of tests uh, depending on the application of course um these events also bring into sharp focus the need for drought resistant grass and clover vari varieties in the UK. Uh, I think a number of these these species in in the past have been developed for um other countries uh, for other climates across the world, but but obviously you know that there is due to climate change and other reasons there are obviously a need for for us to to to, to also adapt in the UK when 
when we when we see our warmer summers and, and wetter winters. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, in terms of glass steer derogations, and uh, we understand that um, there were some derogations were offered to some farmers last year on a case-by-case case -case basis. Uh, and while it wasn't 100% clear whether that meant the farmer having to sacrifice their payment for that option in part, as part of the scheme, uh, there were some delays in, in in responding to those farmers. So, so again, you know, if we can sort of preempt as as far as possible uh, and be a bit more proactive with these sort of events, then then we can try and put those things in place to to make sure the farmers can be as um, flexible as possible, really, when they're faced with these difficult um, situations. Um, and finally, um, and this this applies to the Welsh and the UK governments to an extent, really, is, is that um, when when farmers are facing these difficult um, these difficult times um, that, you know, we need to avoid a situation as much as possible where they are faced with additional red tape. Uh, and, you know, for instance, last year, farmers were starting to prepare for the uh, second stage of the water resources regulations that came in on the 1st of January and, um, you know, having to having to deal with uh, certain derogations, selling stock, um, you know, buying more fodder, uh, impacts on the cash flow, et cetera. It, you know, it's, it's um, you know, we need to consider that that a lot of things can come at once and, and try and avoid those situations as much as possible where they are overloaded with all sorts of changes and, and ad 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 adaptations. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I'll, there's my email address if if anybody wants to get in touch. And uh, I look forward to the to, to the questions at the end. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Gareth. Next we have Thomas Elmet. Tom is the South West Area Water Resources Manager for Welsh Water. He covers the patch from Barry to Borth. He provides technical support to drought plans, water resource management plans, and abstraction license changes, as well as technical advice and management of operational responses to the dry weather events of 2018, 20, and the drought of 22. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Melissa. I'll share my screen, and if you could just confirm that my audio is coming through okay. Audio is fine, Tom. Great. Well, we can see your slide as well. Thank seeing, you. Is that correct now? You're just seeing the yes. slide and not my notes. Yeah, that's Great. fine. Super. Yeah. So thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk through the Welsh Water experience of the 2022 drought. Uh, my, uh, as Melissa said, I work in the water resources team, so it's our job to make sure that we've got enough water to meet all of our customers' needs without impacting the environment and doing that in the most cost-effective way that we can. And so our team is placed right in the thick of how we manage our operational response to dry weather and drought. So I'm going to cover the preparation and monitoring that we uh, undertake, a timeline of key events from 2022, the operational response of the company and a huge number of teams and colleagues involved in that, and the response of our customers to, in particular, to the temporary use ban. That photo in the background is from uh, Aladisa for Reservoir in North Wales and was taken in 2022 and you can see how low the reservoir level was, but most of my photos in the slide deck aren't from uh, 2022. So this uh, screenshot of a document on the left is our drought plan from 2020, which sets out how we manage drought. Uh, the drought plan is a requirement of the Water Industry Act in 1991. Uh, the statutory drought plan uh, includes learning from 2018 and it details what we'll do as a company when uh, we're moving through the stages of drought. So it covers uh, internal governance structures and how we convene decision making groups. It covers the use of drought action zones, which is something I'll come on to in a little bit more detail later on including some supply actions, in particular those which are outside of our normal licensed volumes and demand actions and key messages and the environmental monitoring that supports those uh, drought permits and drought orders. 
It also uh, references our use of the code of practice for water use restrictions and goes alongside a comms plan, which covers all the communications that we do as a company as we move through the stages of drought. The central screenshots there are the dry weather operating manuals. These are not public documents, but one of the key learnings of the 2018 dry weather was that we wanted to more robustly capture the actions that we take uh, in preparation for drought and have those uh, accessible to the relevant people within the business. So have those captured. And then this schematic on the right shows our water resource zones. And the water resource zone is the fundamental unit really for water resources planning. It defines an area of customers who can expect to see to receive the same level of service from us. So those Customers are essentially on one supply system that may have some conjunctivity, so water may be moved around from sources, but they'll all experience the same frequency of temporary use bands, and that's what I mean by level of service. The zones on that diagram are shaded according to the drought trigger that we use in that zone. The pink zones on the right-hand side uh, use a demand trigger, and the cyan zone in the middle which is how in Abu Dhabi uses a river flow trigger for drought on the Avon Vatu. Sorry, my PIR has gone. Uh, and then the purple zones are our water source zones that use a storage trigger, so reservoir storage. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, the um, storage trigger, because we use what we call drought action zones. And this plot on the left-hand side shows the drought action zone for Pembrokeshire. You can see there's five colored bands on that plot. Normal operation, developing drought, drought, severe drought, and emergency storage. And those bands then are uh, detailed in the drought plan with the supply and demand actions that we take as we move through those. So in the normal zone, we work to operational control curves, which govern how we use our sources in a cost-effective way, but reduce uh, use of sources where we need to protect storage as storage declines. We also undertake normal water efficiency messaging and maintain our leakage performance in the normal zone. As we move into developing drought, we uh, complete full optimization of our water resources and do targeted enhanced leakage control. We'll do more customer messaging and review our drought sources. Uh, those drought permits and drought orders that I referred to earlier and prepare for temporary use bans. In drought, the gold command structure will be implemented where needed and uh, we do even further messaging to support the temporary use bans. Uh, we do the environmental monitoring to support drought permits and drought orders. And then in severe drought, it's uh, going one step beyond the temporary use ban uh, that would be implemented in drought to something called a non-essential use ban, which has a, a wider impact on um, non-domestic customers in particular, I would say. And we actually implement environmental drought permits and drought orders. And then finally, the pink band is emergency storage where standpipes and rotor cuts would potentially be required. So that's something that we really uh, want to avoid at all times. Just looking back at the diagram on the left there, you can see the red line, uh, which was storage in 2022 coming down. And you can see how that storage crossed through developing drought and into drought, but never entered severe drought. That step up in storage in uh, around the start of August was because we're presenting net storage on this plot, which is the storage after our freshet bank is accounted for. That's the block of water in the reservoir that we preserve for Natural Resources Wales' use. Uh, in the start of August, Natural Resources Wales had not requested a freshet yet, but they knew that they would need some freshets. They were able to confirm that they wouldn't need to use the whole freshet bank in the remainder of the year. So we recovered some of that freshet and storage moved back up. Just a very quick view here of a, these drought action zones. So it's not just Lisa Fran in Pembrokeshire that receives a drought action zone, but all of those uh, zones that use storage triggers have them. You can see that they come in different shapes uh, and that uh, corresponds to potentially different hydrology for those catchments or a different ratio of um, reservoir size to demand size to catchment size. 
The zones on the left are ones which entered developing drought. So there's none from Northwest, but Cloyd Coastal and Alwyn D in uh, Northeast Wales, both uh, entered the developing drought storage, although very briefly at Alwyn D, but there's a winter uh, refill aspect there that we keep very close eye on. It's actually recovered well now. Mid and South Ceredigion in the bottom left and Sucus, which is the South East Wales conjunctive use system in the bottom right, which entered developing drought. So a couple of the key events outside of the timescale for the temporary use ban. Actually, I'll just click back to make sure I cover that timeline for temporary use ban in PEMS. Uh, 17th of June was when Pembrokeshire was declared in developing drought, and the 19th of August was when we moved it into drought formally. Uh, 25th of October was the point at which, and this was the red storage, which isn't shown on here, the, rec the recovery of storage was sufficient to remove the temporary use ban. So yeah, a couple of other key points from that year. In February, uh, people might remember that we had three named storms in one week ending on the 25th of February. And so the wet weather really ended with a bang, but then it was dry from that point onwards, really. Spring preparation commenced in mid-March and in April, we were starting to issue forecasts internally of what we thought could happen to storage through the year. In May, our head of service calls were convened where the heads of service of various department in, in the water supply side of Welsh Water were meeting um, to talk through the actions that needed to be undertaken. In July, the Welsh National Drought Group was convened and we had local meetings reporting to NRW as well. And then in August, the subgroup of the UK National Drought Group was convened to share uh, how temporary use bans were being consisted, uh, implemented in a consistent way. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the operational actions that our teams undertake to preserve water in our reservoirs and to try to prevent drought or to uh, protect resource for drought. It's a, a massive effort uh, and it goes through months and months of a year like last year. Um, it covers all sides of the water supply business. So I wanted to talk through those actions a bit, taking a, a source to tap approach for some of them. On the raw water side at the very top of the system, in our catchments, we had uh, our catchment teams sampling reservoir water quality because we were expecting to use draw offs that we hadn't used uh, for perhaps years or even decades, sampling those points so that we understood the water quality for the treatment process. We had dam safety teams uh, recommissioning valves which haven't been or hadn't been used again potentially for decades. We had intake structures on streams being cleared out, boreholes being commissioned, um, and the, all of that work is just on the raw side. So even before it gets to a treatment uh, treatment plant, we also had uh, raw water mains being walked and drone surveys of raw water mains where it's possible to use uh, drone photography to identify areas of lush vegetation that indicate a potential potential leak on a raw main that then can be addressed. And then on the treatment side, there was actions to prevent, or sorry, to preserve more water there by treating water more efficiently. So some of the things that were done there were around um, putting in what's called a temporary return to head of work scheme. So in a water treatment process, there's water that's used to backwash filters and that water would normally go to waste. We invested in some schemes to actually return that backwash water to the top of the treatment process so that it wasn't wasted, it then returned through the process. We also did some optimization of filter run times uh, and work like that to make those treatment works as efficient as possible. And then on our distribution networks, we had lots and lots of colleagues uh, going out doing leakage detection. That leakage detection was targeted so that it was in areas where we either had a resource concern or potentially a peak demand concern that needed to be uh, addressed. On our raw water pumping stations, we had uh, optimization work to flatten the rates of abstraction to maximize the efficiency of the use of sources. Uh, on regulation schemes, 
releasing water from river, such as the alids. Uh, we had a lot of effort there to make sure those regulation releases were really efficient and really tight, so that we only released how much we needed to then take downstream. In North Ariri, we implemented a matrix management of our sources, which was learning from 2018. Uh, and that matrix is a way for us to assess the reservoir storages across multiple parts of the system there and balance that use. We'd also implemented some schemes in 2018 that increased our capacity to move water around. So we had additional flexibility there for that matrix to be uh, applied. And we also had some additional conjunctivity that we'd implemented in 2018, particularly in Llyn Harlech and Barmouth, where we were able to use uh, Llyn Tequin to support Llyn Bodlin and Avi Mawr. Um, so uh, I hope the point's clear there, that there's an enormous amount of work that goes on within the business to do the right thing by our customers and by the environment um, before we go to... Um, measures which might impact the environment or uh, impact our customers. This next slide is just to briefly show the effect of some of those operational actions. Hopefully you can see here this yellow line along the top. This is storage in Rosebush Reservoir, which is a small reservoir in PEMS. And although I've presented it with a drought action zone, this is one of those examples where the drought action zone no longer triggers the drought status for the zone because we've got sufficient conjunctivity in that zone to not need to set drought off this reservoir. But nonetheless, I'll use it as an example of the effectiveness of operational actions. So you can see at the start of the year in April, the treatment works was being maximized and we do that because it's low cost water which can be supplied under gravity to areas in West Pembrokeshire like St David's and Oakwood in central Pembrokeshire. But that was causing the storage to drop quite quickly. So we took early action to minimize the works throughput, rezoning those two areas onto a different treatment works. And we also commenced a pump back from Slisafran Reservoir to support Priscelli. As that continued to decline, we then started our Pont Howell uh, water pumping station on the Eastern Clethai to further support the source. Now I want to talk a little bit about the communications piece that went along with the uh, operational actions. So this was happening through the year. This is just a summary of the national communications. There's a similar uh, table for Pembrokeshire, which shows Pembrokeshire specific work, but I, I won't present that. I just want to make the point of the scale of uh, communications action that's undertaken. So we've got um, TV ads being booked. Uh, our CEO was on numerous interviews with BBC and the like. There's national radio adverts paid for social media um, and uh, print media as well, eventually. Um, we targeted comms at caravan parks in Pembrokeshire because there's such high tourist demand. Our wholesale service centre contacted non-household customers. Uh, and then through the Welsh National Drought Group, as has been mentioned by Tracy and Gareth Williams with Welsh Government and our w, uh, WUF um, and Havrand of Rudwy. In August, when the temporary use ban was imposed, we had our uh, letter go out to customers from our chief executive a week before that. Uh, that letter was really well received, actually. And then when the temporary use ban was imposed, we had our community van down in Pembrokeshire visiting the main conurbations. And myself and a number of colleagues from Water Resources and from our customer side uh, had the chance to go out and meet customers and answer any questions that they had. This is just a quick snapshot of some of those comms that went out. So the letter from Peter Perry, including a uh, explanation of what the house pipe ban covers. So that letter explained to customers that um, the tub, the temporary use ban, which is sometimes called call a tub, uh, covers watering of a garden or any plants on a domestic property uh, in, uh, when using a house pipe. It covers filling or maintaining a domestic pond or ornamental fountain or swimming pool or hot tub. And it covers a lot of domestic cleaning that would be done with a hose pipe, whether that's cleaning of windows or walls or cars. But there are exceptions for uh, priority services customers. Also exceptions if hose pipes are being used to water plants for food in particular. 
uh, and those exceptions are applied in a consistent way with other water companies off the back of the code of practice which was developed in 2013. I've also showed a, a screenshot there of the temporary use ban uh, website which uh, went live uh, and the uh, comms that went out to inform our customers of the end of the restrictions. And then finally, finally, the impact of the tub on customer perception of Welsh water. And I think this is actually a real surprise to a lot of us uh, because we'd always had the attitude that, um, or maybe suspected is a better word, that uh, customers would really struggle with uh, the imposition of a temp use ban. But remarkably, of, um, of respondents on a survey that we undertook after the temporary use ban, uh, and 43 of these respondents lived in the impacted area in Pembrokeshire, 35% of those customers said that the tub had, had a positive impact on perceptions of Welsh water. Customers understood that the tub was done for the right reasons, it was necessary and needed to be taken seriously, and there was a sense that limiting hosepipe use was a small ask. One of the other key learnings for us was that the letter which I mentioned that went out to customers had really strong recall and we were the only water company in the UK who imposed temporary use bans that uh, did so with a letter to all our customers um, and I think for a lot of people this was just seen as something that needed to be done and certainly when I met customers out in, in Pembrokeshire I was really amazed at the um, sort of diligence with which people had taken on the temporary use ban. I met customers who would run their hot water into a uh, washing up bowl until it got hot and preserved that lukewarm or cold water so that they could use that in their garden. And uh, it was remarkable to see that support from our customers. Uh, I think that is it from me, um, uh, Melissa. So um, thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, Tom. Very interesting talk and thank you Tracy and Gareth as well. Um, if it's okay I'll go straight over to questions. We've got a few in the Q&A section. Um, so the first question is from Paul Smith. Um, he's asking Tracy how much resource did the drought session season sorry season take on your incident response? Can I just check you can hear me? Yes we can Tracy. Yeah this is that sometimes I've found it's been cutting in and out. Um, well, you can answer that in two ways. Um, you could look at it uh, in terms of responding to the physical incidents reported in as a consequence of the drought uh, through our hotline, um, our environment management teams or our land managers responding to fires, things like that, would have each of incident in itself would have created a variety of resources deployed and depending on the consequence of that um, would, would have involved a, a significant amount of people and, and a multi-agency response, particularly in, in relation to fires. Um, and a lot of the incidents occurred during July and August, so the resource in, intense, intensified there was during that period. But in terms of the drought planning and management and responding as drought teams, our three operational drought teams and our strategic NRW drought team has uh, drought coordinate, drought managers and core members that are effectively offline from their business as usual activities from, from the outset or from prolonged dry weather to, to the recovery of drought for that whole period with members on that drought team meeting and they may not have been full time but they may have been uh, spending several days acting on what was happening with people were people were monitoring people were also advising others we were also regulating the water companies and others so a significant amount of effort and at some point potentially hundreds of people could have been involved but they may have not been full time they may have been a couple of days to me who was doing it for months so so an awful lot of effort there depending on what was happening on the ground and who we were uh, communicating with about what the impacts were. Okay, thank you very much, Tracy. I'll move on to the next question and I'll come to Gareth first if I can. Um, so um, we don't know who this is from, but um, they're asking about if we were to experience another drought this year, 
how devastating would it be and are there any actions we can take now to reduce the severity of these impacts? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jane. Thank, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I think I covered a couple of the, couple of the well, I covered the answer really to this question in in, in my slides really. But um, you know, the, a drought can have a number of impacts on from an agricultural perspective at least, um, and many of those impacts can last um, you know beyond that that year, um, beyond that season. Because as I mentioned, you know, a number of farmers were having to sell stock, breeding stock last year. Um, so obviously you know, that, that could have an effect on, on how many breeding stock they have uh, in, in this year and following years. So it's, you know, there is a, certainly a long-term impact depending on how severe it is um, in, in that area or for, for that particular farmer, for instance. Um, but obviously, no, you know, no two years are the same. And I, and I mentioned that earlier on. So it's, it is difficult to, to predict how the impact, what the impacts would, would necessarily be. Um, because for instance, if you had a drought, uh, in a year following a, a really really productive and and good growing year, then then the actual then you might not actually ne necessarily end up with a fodder sh shortage because it might balance out over 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 a two or three year period, for instance. So, um, but I but I, as I mentioned at the end of my presentation, um, you know we can be more proactive with these sort of events, and it's the, you know the likelihood likelihood is that we are, that we will see more extreme weather events in future, whether that includes. You know, wetter winters, flash floods, for instance, uh, or on the other other end of the scale uh, in terms of drought. So, um, you know, for instance, we could have maybe a, a spring meeting of the drought liaison group in in the spring just to see the outlook of of, of the rainfall from the beginning of the year and and hopefully try and predict um, what the what, what the rainfall and what the growing season will be like for the coming year and and try and you know if if we think that that it will be a particularly dry um, season then. And potentially uh, bring some measures in place um, ahead of that time. So, so when, for instance, farmers with derogations or or we need to see a, uh, a, a reduced water use in certain areas, then we can try and you know uh, be a bit more proactive with it. But you know, as I mentioned, it's 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 we all know that weather is is difficult difficult to predict in, in the in the long term. Great, thank you very much. Can I come to Tom now for your answer on this question? Yep, yeah, thanks, Melissa. So I think that we're in a fairly fortunate position in Welsh water in that all of our reservoirs recovered very well over the winter, in particular through October through to December. February was dry, so we did start to see reservoirs declining again, but they have now substantially recovered and we're in a healthy position going into the start of the year. I don't think that's the same for all water companies across the UK. Uh, and that's a result of a difference in hydrology uh, in the catchments of different companies, as well as the rainfall patterns that we've seen over the winter so far. In terms of our business preparedness for drought, I don't think that that's been impacted negatively. If anything, it's stronger because we have an improved understanding of how to implement temporary use bans and a bit more insight into uh, drought permits and drought orders, even though none of those were actually applied for in 2022, there was the process that was engaged with and there's a lot of learning from that. So if anything, I would say as a company, we're in a stronger position to deal with future droughts uh, and we're fortunate in that hydrologically we're in a pretty decent position going into the start of the year, although obviously as Tracy said, every drought can be different. So if we had a drought this year that was longer than last year or more extreme in terms of the uh, intensity of the drought, drier over the same period, we would potentially start to see a, a, a worse response in reservoirs. Okay, thank you, Tom. Tracy, how about you? Yeah, I mean, as, as Tom alluded to, we were getting a bit worried about February because that turned out to be the driest February in 30 years. But and March started off a little bit dry, but the rainfall in the last week has, has uh, returned March to a normal, what you'd expect. So the rivers currently are flowing well, should we say, and our land is quite wet at the moment, but we're monitoring the situation closely. It's worth mentioning, um, and we haven't mentioned it, is groundwater. Um, um, I think I'm right in saying that only about 5% of um, 
public water supply is on groundwater and wells, but of course private water supply is very light on groundwater, which is the remit, the local authorities, and the groundwater um, had was lower than normal for the start of the year, so potentially they could could see concerns earlier for private water supplies than we would public water supplies, and um, well, Strout Liaison Group will be engaging and local authorities will be engaging, but we as yet to know really what are the long lasting impacts of drought and so our surveys that are ongoing as we speak are our year one year five surveys of trees and things like that will give us some idea of the lasting impacts and we're compiling a picture of that as we speak and and then any of the lessons identified coming out of review will inform our drought planning for the future and potentially inform future policy requirements through discussions with Welsh Government. So really we're watching the situation at the moment quite closely. But it's hard to predict, you know, what's going to happen. Of course, Tracy. Okay, thank you. I've got another question for Gareth now um, from Tiffany. Does um, NFU know the total economic cost to agricultural sectors across UK due to last year's drought? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Tiffany. I, I work for the Farmers Union of Wales, uh, not the National Farmers National Farmers Union. So, um, so I, I suppose the you know, the the NFU for for, for England w w would probably you know would probably be the best to ask from from a UK outlook. But but I would say that the it's probably near impossible to to have a, an accurate figure as to how how uh, the drought has has cost farmers over the last 12 months and how much how, how much of an impact the drought has had on its own given the number of other impacts that we've, that we've seen in terms of uh, um, uh, production, production costs um, input costs uh, due to a number of other factors such as the conflict in Ukraine for instance so so I, so I would say it's, it's it's it would be extremely difficult to get uh, uh, you know a figure just just for, for the drought um but I think, uh, you know, following a drought in the US and Europe back in 2012, um, global food prices increased by around 10 percent. So, you know, hopefully that can give you some sort of indication as to uh, you know, how severe the drought, how, how severe the impacts the drought could have on, 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 you know, not necessarily just production, but, but how that then will follow through in terms of food prices, et cetera. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll move on to the next question um, from Neil. Um, he's asking, how are the springs in Pembrokeshire? Are they still showing below normal levels? So, well, yeah. Sorry. Tom or Tracy, probably. <laughs> yeah. If you, I was if just you want to answer it, Tracy, go ahead. I was just going to say, obviously, we monitor some groundwater sites. Um, Grange Hill Garage is our site down there and when I looked at the end of the month because February was um, dry it was was notably low exceptionally low but rate of groundwater is slow to react to rainfall so I assume it'll still be showing that but but given that we've had rainfall I would expect it to rise but in terms of the effect that Pembrokeshire Council would be the people you probably need to contact in terms of private wards like consequences and in fact it's fair to say um, we weren't hearing of many impacts in the Welsh Drought Liaison Group because we think that learning from 2018 and 2020 means that people have um, adapted themselves to, to um, you know to, uh, re in their boreholes out and things like that so so in fact there was perhaps I think it's fair to say, Tom, isn't it? Perhaps less concerns in Pembrokeshire in 2022 than there was in the previous years in terms of private water supplies. But springs and things will dry up quicker depending on how shallow they are. But groundwater is generally lower when it where, than where it needs to be currently. Do you want to add anything to that, Tom? I just add that uh, we only have one spring source for public water supply in Pembrokeshire, and it contributes less than or perhaps around two percent of the water resource zones distribution, which is the amount of water that goes into public water supply. Uh, that source is running well. Uh, last time I checked, which was last week, it was looking healthy. But more significantly, our reservoirs are both full 
and our river flows are healthy at the moment. Okay, great answer, guys. Thank you. Um, I think next question for Gareth here. Um, is there any government grants for offline storages for farmers in Wales? Um, not that I'm aware of, actually. This was something that was raised in the, the drought liaison group last year, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier on. Um, you know, it would, would be useful for, for there to be grants available for farmers to store rainwater, mm. um, etc. Um, you know, ahead of um, events like, like drought, like we saw last year. Um, but, I, but from my understanding, there's, there's nothing available yet. And, you know, if we if we look at the pro latest proposals for a sustainable farming scheme, you know, there, there is a part of that that at the moment at least will require farmers to have so, so much uh, you know, ponds uh, on, on their land. Uh, now, you know, that, that could become problemsome for some because I think it's it, it will be a, a universal action, so it will be a, a compulsory part of the scheme. Uh, but there's definitely an opportunity for it, for it to be an optional part of the scheme. So those, those farmers who are in uh, those particular areas which are prone to drought, maybe that, that, that maybe, you know, may want to go down that route and, and install um, with the support from the Welsh Government, install some sort of collections of facilities to help them during, during the dry periods. OK, thank you. Um, and I have a question from David. Um, specifically for Tom. In the future, would uh, Welsh Water do anything differently in terms of communicating tubs with customers, given how well it was received? For example, what's your thoughts on using new strategies such as TikTok? Yeah, I do love the thought of uh, our CEO on TikTok. Um, but as a company, I don't think we'd have any hostility to that. I, I think we already engage in social media. We do Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. So we're pretty keen on that. But what we saw in the customer feedback was the letter, the physical letter to people had generated much more recall. That's to say that when surveyed about our, com our communications, it was the letter that people referenced. So I think that's actually really interesting learning about the uh, sort of accessibility of the social media, but how hard something hits when it's actually in print. I, I personally thought that was really interesting. We did, the only other thing I'd say is I'm aware that there was influencer engagement uh, as part of our social media strategy. I don't know specifically what that means, but if there's TikTok stars who are influencers <laughs> that we've engaged with, then I guess that would be um, something that we look to do in the future if it was successful. Okay, Can I thank you. Just interject and say, obviously, also Consumer Accounts for Water did quite a lot of um, quite interactive videos and things on their website as well, didn't they, Tom? So they're worth a mention to check out Consumer Accounts for Water's website. Yes, and there's also TikTok videos about how to save water, which we don't recommend. <laughs> um, some people may have yeah. seen some of the ones that went viral last year that were very funny, but not, not practically beneficial for preserving water resources. Okay, guys. Well, I think that's the the end of the session or end of the Q and A session. No more coming in. Um, I was going to ask one uh, more question, if that's okay. Um, Tracy, what do you think the prospects are for the year coming? I think um, sort of touched on that. I mean, if you asked us this last week, we might have been a bit twitchy because, as we say, February had 24% long-term average and was the driest February in 30 years. And in fact, the 13th driest on record as well. And But now I sit here uh, after a week of rain and seeing the rainfall stats and the river flows and your reservoir levels, Tom, were a little bit immediately less concerned about the spring to come. But who's to say? I mean, last year we were sat here after a wet February and then and then it was at all April and um, May that suddenly came dry. So therefore, you know, suddenly the outlook was looking worse than it was two months before. So the outlook at the moment is for average rainfall uh, for the rest next three months. The groundwater and the hydrological outlook are saying near average river flows and groundwater. So we just hope that as long as we get average rainfall now, 
we should be okay, but who's to say what beyond three months would bring? But hopefully we're in a good position to cope with or to respond to drought, given that we've just had drought experience and the multi-agency response through the Welsh Drought Liaison Group. So hopefully we'll be set up to hit the ground running. Um, I don't know what your guy, your thoughts are. I think uh, the groundwater is an area to watch at the moment, more so than the other indicators at the moment. Yeah, perhaps. I think uh, that that's a fair question, Tracy. It, like you said before, it does uh, make a very small proportion of public water supply in Wales. And the groundwater that we do use is often uh, through the gravel aquifers adjacent to rivers. And a number of those rivers are supported by regulation releases through the summer from the reservoirs upstream. So they're hydro hydrologically connected, hydraulically connected to the reservoir resources, as opposed to perhaps large aquifer uh, boreholes, which are used in other areas. So it's a slightly different aspect there, I think. Yeah, I think I was, yeah, I was more meaning those on private water supply. Um, yeah, no, that's yeah. fair. And agriculture for, um, the soils have started to wet now, haven't they? Gareth, as you were saying, grass was growing, so, yeah. Okay, I've got, uh, there's another little question that sneaked in. It's um, for Tom. Are Welsh Water going to continue with messaging regarding saving water at all times, not just in a drought? Absolutely. We have background and organic social media comms that promote uh, water efficiency for our customers. And it's not just communications as well. There's practical steps that we take as a company to support water efficiency. So the one that I'd like to mention is our project Cartrev, where we'll fix free of charge uh, leaky loos and leaks in people's homes and support them with water efficient devices. I've personally accessed that service uh, and had two leaking uh, loos fixed in my property. The loos were both on the dual flush system and those dual flush ones are a bit notorious for uh, over time starting to, to leak. And so if anybody on the call in Wales, in our operating area, has got a loo which they notice that it, there's water sort of running through that constantly, then um, please contact our Project Cartrev, Cartrev team. Um, I'll drop the link in the Q&A if I can, um, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks. I think it's time to, to thank everybody now. Um, well, thanks, guys. It's Like I say, it's been brilliant today having three speakers. Um, thank you very much for um, sharing your, your sort of thoughts and information from your sectors. Um, Barbara, did you want to come in now and say something? I'd just like to thank um, the Welsh Branch for organising this to our speakers. It's been a very interesting talk. Um, it's always very much appreciated the amount of effort that volunteers and the Kilda committee members and organisers of this event um, put into events and um, look forward to your there's more, more events coming up. Thank you. I will say goodbye to everybody now then. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Barbara. Bye. Thank you very much. Take care.